Well, good morning. Most of you have probably noticed that I am not Pastor Jim. For those of you who are visiting this morning, my name is Lisa Coates, and I'm the Director of Discipleship here at Colonial. And in honor of Mother's Day, Pastor Jim and the Elder Board have asked me to deliver the message. But before I do that, I would just like to invite any baptism candidates that may be in the room to go ahead and take a moment to um, exit at this time. You want to head towards the hallway over on this side of the building, and there'll be a team of people who will direct you and show you uh, how to prepare for the upcoming baptism this morning. Let me start by wishing all of you ladies a very, very happy Mother's Day. Mother's Day is one of those holidays that evoke deep emotion in us. And if you don't believe me, think about your own feelings that rise up when you have to go and purchase a Mother's Day card. Now, how many of you this year went out and bought a Mother's Day card? Let me see your hands. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. You head towards the card section in the store, and you turn a corner, and all of a sudden, you're assaulted by pink. And there is a whole aisle full of these pink cards just waiting for you to start that selection process. But you're not alone in this process. In fact, there's quite a few other people that are going through this painstaking process right there along with you. Now, for some of us, this process is all about finding just the right card to, to express your feelings, to honor your mother. And you may choose a card like this one here, which says, Mom, if you've ever wondered where being a mom fits in among your many accomplishments, I want you to know that to me, it's your greatest success of all. You've been everything to me. The guide who made sure my life got started right. The friend I love being around and the one who believes in me no matter what. Isn't that a heartfelt card? Now, for those of you who have fond memories of your mother, this card has my mom written all over it. And you leave the aisle with this sense of accomplishment that you have found just the right card to honor the person in your life who shaped you into the person you are today. And as you leave that aisle, you pass somebody else. And that somebody may be struggling a little bit. In fact, you may be that person that struggles a little bit this morning. The one who looks at a card like this and physically feels sick to their stomach the one who doesn't have pleasant memories of mom. In fact, you're not even sure why you're in the aisle because you know that there's no Mother's Day card that could ever express the feelings that you have towards your mother. And so out of guilt and frustration, you turn to the only thing that you can think of, and that's probably humor. And you leave that aisle stuffing your emotions and almost feeling this sense of relief that your duty for the year is over. Well, the truth is, is that most of us do not have that perfect greeting card kind of mom. And so this whole process of selecting a Mother's Day card evokes these strong emotions in us. And we sit back and sometimes we think, why should we take a perfectly good Sunday to celebrate moms? Well, the reason that we do it, first of all, is because God commands it. In his word, both in the Old and the New Testament, God tells us to honor our fathers and mothers. Now, the second reason why we would do this is maybe not quite so obvious to us, um, but we see it in the way that God writes family language all throughout the Bible. God uses the term mother in the Bible to express a special side of his heart, a side that we need to see as his children. And motherhood is a very powerful side. In fact, the term mother becomes even more powerful when it's used in the sense of a verb rather than a noun. When it is seen in action instead of in a person. When it's something somebody does rather than who a person is. And so we want to take the next few moments to just look at uh, mother as a verb. We want to move away from maybe that image of mother that isn't so great for you and move into God's image of what he intended motherhood to be. And the best way that we can do this is through the story of Deborah. So we're going to turn there in just a few minutes. But I want to just share a, a definition with you this morning from the book Captivating by John and Stacy Eldridge. They define motherhood as this. All women are not mothers, but all women are called to mother. To mother is to nurture to train, to educate, and to rear. 
As daughters of Eve, all women are uniquely gifted to help others become more of who they truly are, to encourage, nurture, and mother them towards their true selves. In doing this, women partner with Christ in that vital mission of bringing forth life. Now, what this definition tells us and reveals to us is the heart of God. And the way that God has wired women is to see that special, unique thing in that child and to call that person out to be that special child. No matter what your situation is, maybe you didn't have a mother, um, whoever that noun was in, in your life, and maybe she didn't give you this message, but God sends us this message this morning. He says, I see who you are. And I call you out to be that person. And maybe your birth mother didn't give you that message, but God sends other mothers in our lives to deliver that message. And this is where Deborah comes in. If you're taking notes this morning, our big idea is this. Mothering portrays God's heart to shape us into our true selves. And we're going to turn to the book of Judges. You can do that in your Bible. There's some in the seat front, in front of you. Um, also, if you have a phone, you can look it up on version. But while you're turning there, I just thought I would share one of my favorite ways to celebrate Mother's Day. Um, typically, that involves uh, some sort of activity that I do with my children, followed by a meal that I don't have to prepare, and finally ending the day by either watching family movies or a special chick flick that my children have selected just for me. And so in honor of that tradition, we have chosen a chick flick this morning for you, and it's found in the book of Judges. Now, have you ever wondered why God would put a chick flick in the middle of an action-packed book like Judges? <clears throat> Let's kind of take a survey here and be honest this morning. How many of you ladies would choose the movie Braveheart or Gladiator as your favorite Mother's Day pick to watch today? I see maybe one or two hands. Thank you for being honest. Now, most of us, if our husband or our children came home today and brought that movie, we would probably send them back to Redbox and tell them to try again. The reason is um, the same reason we see here in the book of Judges, that it is an action-adventure uh, sort of book that men are drawn to and not necessarily women. Now, throughout the book of Judges, we also see this repeated cycle happening in Israel's relationship with God. And we call this cycle the cycle of sin and the cycle of deliverance. And I have a chart for you this morning to kind of help us understand this a little bit. Um, we see that Israel begins life living under God's blessing. Under God's blessing, they experience freedom and they experience prosperity. But then Israel decides that they're going to do it their own way. They're going to turn away from God and they're going to do their own thing. And so this lands them in a place of pain and suffering. And usually that pain and suffering happened under another nation's um, rulership. Uh, they would become enslaved and, and kept in bondage and captivity. And when they couldn't stand it any longer, Israel would cry out to God and God would hear them. And God would send a deliverer in the form of a judge. And all of a sudden, blessing would be restored. Now, doesn't this cycle sound a little familiar to us? Maybe a little bit like the book of Proverbs that we've been studying in our church family over the last five weeks. But let's take this cycle a little bit closer to home. Let's see how it looks in the context of a marriage covenant. Now, in a marriage covenant, we begin under God's blessing. Uh, we are, our hearts are turned towards our spouse and towards God. But it doesn't take long in the marriage to realize that your spouse and you are two different people with two different opinions and two different ideas of doing things. And what happens when we want our own way over God's way or over our spouse's way or finding that compromise somewhere in the relationship? It causes us to turn away from each other. And in turning away, we are thrown into this cycle and sometimes years and years of this repeated cycle of pain and suffering where we repeat these patterns in our relationship that hurt one another. And when the pain becomes too hard for us, we cry out for help. And hopefully in our crying out, we cry out to God who is able to restore our relationships. 
Now, this is the cycle that we see in Israel's relationship with God. When the pain became too great, they would cry out to God, and God would hear them, and he would send mighty men, people like Ehud or Gideon or probably the most popular Samson, um, to come in and save the day as mighty warriors. So why in this book of Judges would God choose to send a woman instead? Clearly, this was a man's job. And I believe it's God capturing our attention this morning. He breaks from this whole patriarchal pattern so that we can see a different side of his heart. And it's the side of his heart that he places in every single woman who is able to see who a person is and call that person out to become the man or woman of God. So let's look a little deeper into this book. Now what we have going on here in Judges chapter 4 is another cycle. We see that Israel begins under the blessing of God. Under the judge Ehud, they lived 80 years in freedom and prosperity. When Ehud died, Israel chose to do their own thing once again. And so God allowed King Jabin uh, of Canaan to come in and cause pain and suffering in their lives. King Jabin had a man named Caesarea, who was the leader over his army, who had 900 chariots fitted with iron. And we're going to talk about those chariots in just a little bit. But what I want you to see um, is in verse 3, it talks about how Israel lived in this condition for 20 years. Now, 20 years is a long time to live under oppression, to be beaten down, to lose your identity, to lose all hope. And when Israel could no longer stand the pain of this oppression, they cry out to God. And this time, God sends Deborah, a woman. And it's interesting to note this aspect because I think it helps us to understand God's heart a little bit more clearly. There are three things that I'd like us to see this morning, a side of God's heart in the mothering, um, in the way that mothers uh, mother. Uh, To mother is to hear and to respond to a child's cry. When Howard and I brought our first child home from the hospital, I was amazed at how quickly my ears tuned to every little noise that our Caleb made. As a new mom, I quickly learned how to differentiate between different cries. One cry meant he was hungry. Another cry meant that he uh, was in pain, and yet there was another cry that kind of indicated he was kind of frustrated for some reason, and sometimes it would even escalate into this full-blown temper tantrum. Mothers are wired in some way to understand and differentiate between the cries of their children. No one understands how she knows this. No one understands how in the midst of a crowded room like that, she can single out the voice of her child, and yet she does. And this is the picture that God wants us to see this morning of who he is. He hears the cry of his children. And in this case, Israel's cry was coming from this place of pain and oppression. And God responds. And he says, sends Deborah on the scene. We see this mother language in Judges chapter 5, verse 7, when Deborah says this, Village life in Israel ceased, ceased until I, Deborah, arose a mother in Israel. Now, this is an interesting um, self-description. Uh, there's a rabbi, Mendel uh, Weinbach, that uh, explains this Jewish terminology. Um, it was understood in a Jewish home that women had a place of, of leadership in their home. And uh, it's interesting because if you look in Judges chapter 4, verse 4, Deborah is described as a prophetess, a judge, and a leader. But this is not how she chooses to identify herself. She chooses to identify herself as a mother so that we can understand what was happening in this story. You see, as a prophetess, Deborah had a special relationship with God. Her ears were tuned to the voice of God. And in a time of oppression when no one could hear God, God chose the one who would hear him and deliver him and and deliver his people. And that was Deborah. What we also see about Deborah was that she was a judge. And as a judge, she had a special relationship with the children of Israel. And that relationship looked, again, like that of a mother. You see, 
Deborah didn't go into the city gates where most of the disputes were handled in that day. She didn't set herself up as a judge. Rather, she sat under a tree and the children of Israel just flocked to her. They wanted her wisdom. They wanted her counsel. And as she listened to their cases, God helped her to discern the cries of the children of Israel. God helped her to hear their voice. And I think that sounds a lot like mothering to me. Isn't it amazing how in a room full of people, a child will bypass dad, they'll bypass big brother, they'll even bypass grandma and grandpa, and then will run straight to mom. All these people who are capable of helping this child, but they will run to mom first and foremost. And I believe that's just because a child recognizes that their cry stirs the heart of a mother. And this is what we see in the mother heart of God. Think of it like this. No one wants to get up in the middle of the night and take care of somebody else, especially when they've messed their diaper or maybe gotten sick all over their bed or maybe woken up from a nightmare and they're crying out. But a mother hears that, and her response is immediate. And this is the heart of God that we see. Not only did Deborah recognize the cries of the children of Israel, she recognized who these children belonged to, and that was God himself. And the second aspect we see of mothering is this. To mother is to identify and encourage a child's true self. Have you ever heard of the term mother's intuition before? I think mother's intuition is a term that the world uses to try to describe the way God has wired mother, mothers to know something that they really don't know how they know. It's just that gut instinct in a mother that identifies deep-seated issues or maybe hidden character traits uh, in the true nature of her child. And a mother calls that out. This is the insight that Deborah had regarding the gift of God in Barak. So she summons this man, Barak, to her, and she prepares to deliver God's message to him. And I believe that, like any mother, she tried the gentle approach first. Most mothers will try to pad things down and soften the blow. Um, but when that doesn't work, what do they resort to? They resort to the ear-pulling, tough love kind of approach that says, we're going to get this out in the open. We're going to talk about it. We're going to communicate. You see, Barak was the most unlikely person from the most unlikely tribe in Israel, called to do an impossible mission. And God knew that if Barak was going to be battle ready, he was going to need a lot of mothering. And this is exactly what Deborah steps in to do. The dialogue between this mother in Israel and this son from Naphtali uh, reveals some very important mothering details. You see, in order for Barak to identify who he was in God, and the mission that he was called to, she had to use quite a few of these mothering skills. And even after she has this conversation with him, he is not fully convinced that he is the man for the job. And we see this in his response in verse 8, which says, Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Well, let's take a little survey this morning. How many of you think at first glance of this response, it sounds like a mother or like a son hiding behind his mother's skirt flaps? Sounds a little bit like that, doesn't it? Or maybe you think it sounds like uh, Barack was using Deborah as his good luck charm going into battle. Does that sound a little maybe like his response? Or maybe it sounds like a stubborn child who's giving his mother an ultimatum. Well, scholars debate over the demeanor that Barak was using here, and there's lots of different things we can read into the story, but one thing is clear. He was not going to battle without Deborah. So we see Deborah's response um, in verse 9, where she says, Very well, I will go with you. But because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will hand Caesarea over to a woman. Now, depending on your perspective of motherhood, we could read all sorts of emotions into this. But what we need to see is that Barak had a, a desperate need 
for a mother to point out the consequence of his decision. And that's what mothers sometimes do. We have to call out the consequences to certain behavior in our children. Now, Deborah wasn't emasculating a reluctant warrior here. If that were the case, she would not have gone with him into battle. What was going on here was God working through the mother heart of Deborah, seeing a man who was beaten down by years of oppression, seeing a man who believed in lies spoken by the enemy. And so she's willing to risk her very own life to go with him into battle because she believed in the man that Barak was. There are so many details that we could pull out of this story this morning, and I truly hope that you go home and read Judges chapter 4 and 5 and see some of these for yourself. But there's one more aspect to mothering that I'd like us to see this morning, and that is to mother is to know when to let go. In verse 15, it says, Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Caesarea into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor, followed by 10,000 men. So we finally reached the battle scene here in this story. And what we want to see is that through divine orchestration, Deborah recognized the time that God had for Barak to go. And we see this in the way that he sets things up. Do you remember the 900 chariots that I had mentioned earlier? These chariots were fitted with iron. And the PG version of this story this morning is that these, uh, the foot soldiers of Israel were no match for these ancient day battle tanks. And if you want the more graphic details, you can read chapters 4 and 5. But what we want to see this morning is God's hand in um, giving Israel the advantage. What happened is that God sent a flash flood in a season where it wasn't the rainy season there. If you think about our ground here in Wichita Falls, it's pretty dry. And that would make these chariots move quickly. But what God did was he sent a rainstorm and he flooded the valley. And so these chariots became stuck in the mud. And so Deborah recognized this is the hand of God. And she shouts the battle cry, go. And she releases, Deb- uh, she releases Barak to go into battle with the men. And it's interesting that Deborah understood this timing. You see, she understood what her mission was as a mother in Israel, and she understood that there was a time that she needed to release Barak to go fulfill his mission as well. The only thing left for Deborah to do was to cheer from the sidelines, and that's exactly what she did. In fact, in Judges chapter 5, the whole chapter is a victory song that Deborah writes, and I like to think of chapter 5 as a mother's bragging rights because, well, as moms, we earn that right sometimes to brag about our children, don't we? But Deborah's not the only one that bragged on Barak. You see, in the book of Hebrews, God also brags on Barak. In Hebrews chapter 11, we see a list of heroes of the faith, and Barak is on that. And so it makes us question, how did this zero in the book of Judges go to hero in the book of Hebrews. And for that matter, why didn't God include Deborah in that list, only Barak? I believe that it's because God recognized that even a reluctant warrior can be called out to be his true self and to fulfill the mission that God has for him. So what does this story mean to you and I here today in this audience? And how do we wrestle with this whole idea of needing this spiritual mothering? Well, we often see that God uses family language, such as mother in Israel, to help us understand the shaping that he is doing in our lives as sons and daughters. You see, we've been talking about mother as a verb this morning, but the bigger picture of this whole message is about spiritual parenting. That's why we often say here at Colonial that we are a family on a mission. Because you see, each one of us is God's child. Each one of us is God's teenager. And some of us are even God's spiritual parents that he uses to bring in family, to raise up family, and to send family out. 
You see, we have a generation here that needs a physical reparenting. We have people who have grown up in such dysfunction in their homes that they don't even understand God's order in parenting. We have churches that are in desperate need of spiritual parenting. Every week we have people come into this place and they receive Christ for the first time and they need somebody to come alongside of them and to help them figure this out. And I believe that in this room we have men and women who could function as spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers just by simply giving God's wisdom to a new child of God so that they understand that order of folly out and wisdom in so that they can live under God's blessing and God's protection. So this story begs us to ask ourselves, where are we? Where are we in this family? Will you bow your heads with me this morning and pray? Father, over and over in your word, we see how you lavish your love on us. God, you see who we truly are, and you call us out to be that person. And Lord, we are just so thankful that you are faithful as a parent. And yet, God, I know that you desire to work through people. And Lord, in this place, I believe that you have molded and shaped some people who are ready to parent spiritually. God, I ask that you would forgive us when we don't step into this role. Lord, I pray that you would stir our hearts this morning to hear the cries of your people and to move in response to those cries. Would you stir us and give us the courage to step into this role of spiritual parenting? And Father, I also know that in this place, there is a desperate need for some of us to be parented spiritually. Father, we are living in patterns and cycles in our lives that seem hopeless. And Lord, we cry out to you from the depths of our heart to break this cycle this morning. God, we believe that as we cry out this morning, you have provided a plan, maybe a plan even through spiritual parenting. And we place our hope in you this morning, God, that you will deliver us. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I have one more group of people that I would like to identify here this morning. Maybe you've never heard the story of Deborah and Barak before. Maybe you've never thought about the cycle of sin that happens in someone's life. Maybe as you're sitting here, you realize that you are not living under God's blessing and freedom from sin. And the good news is, is that there's one here that's greater than Deborah. And his name is Jesus Christ. You see, the biblical term for judge does not carry with it condemnation. The biblical term of judge means savior. And Jesus Christ came to break the cycle of sin once and for all. And today he would lay out a plan for your deliverance. And it's as simple as ABC. First, you need to admit that you need him. Second, you need to believe that he died on the cross to pay the price for your sin. And third, you need to commit your life to following and living under his freedom and protection. And if that's you this morning, I ask that you would pray this prayer in your heart with me. Dear God, I need you. I am a sinner, and I need a Savior. And Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross and that you rose again. Will you forgive all my sins? Will you come into my life? Will you fill me with your spirit? Make me new. Lord, I thank you for forgiveness, and I thank you for new life. In Jesus' name, amen.